Uh, to make sure everybody's in the right place, this is the roundtable on funding locally led peace building from principle to practice. Now, I'm Melanie Greenberg from Humanity United, and I will be moderating our amazing group of 11 people today. Um, I first want to thank the Alliance for Peace Building, that for those of you who've been involved in the last couple of days, it has been an extraordinary feat to gather such a warm and vibrant community digitally. And the issues we've been discussing during this really existential moment for peace building have been so important and there's been such creativity. And I would say just regarding our subject today, having peace builders from around the world who've been able to join us has added tremendous richness to the conversation. Um, and just it's really, really wonderful to see that. Um, I'd also like to thank Katriona Gourlay at Peace Nexus. Uh, we came up with the idea for this panel and um, Katrina has just been a wonderful thought partner in all ways, so thank you. And finally, to thank all of our panelists for joining today. Uh, it's a busy time and we're so grateful for your wisdom and your expertise. So why this panel on funding local peace building? I think we've heard of the last few days and have certainly seen throughout the COVID pandemic, the importance and the primacy of local peace building. There's so much energy now towards amplifying the power and the agency of local level, community level peace building. And it's important not only to focus on the work at that level, but also how do we adapt the entire global peace building system to be more responsive to local needs. And as part of that system, donors have been very reflective. And I think this has really come out during COVID where we saw the actions of local peace builders and local humanitarian efforts um, in the pandemic of how can we make sure that our funding is helping local peace building and that some very long held habits around accountability, short term timeframes and other areas where funding has frankly been very difficult. How can we change those patterns? Um, so we have, we require new models of partnership, uh, new ways of thinking about accompaniment new ways about thinking about how to be with local peace builders and what could take a generation. And how do we start to have better collective action in the funding community to really help and accompany these more local efforts. So I have great thanks to the Peace and Security Funders Group whose local peace building working group has worked on a series of principles about how funders can be more effective in funding locally led peace building. And it's just a great pleasure to introduce uh, Libby Hoffman, who's the president of Catalyst for Peace, who's gonna give us an overview to those principles and then lead us into our discussion today. So Libby, I turn the floor to you. And just by the way, um, because we have 11 speakers, I'm not gonna give everyone's bios, but Xander will post in the chat so you can find um, the bios of everyone involved in our conversation today. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. And thank you to Humanity United and Peace Nexus for convening this and giving us this platform to share some of our thinking and experience uh, to the broader field. It's, um, it's exciting and it feels like all good, both tilling the soil and step, really important steps forward. Um, what I would love to do is just, well, first of all, thank Peace and Security Funders Group for their serving as a platform um, for this. And in particular, call out my colleague, Amy Tchaikowski, who's our Director of Global Learning. Um, who was the one within Catalyst for Peace that really spearheaded uh, the effort and also Bridget Moix at Peace Direct. I think a lot of people in the Peace and Security Funders Group um, committed their time and their thought um, uh, to, to this document, but the two of them I think really uh, were the, the ones who shepherded it forward, bore a lot of the, the way to that. What I would like to talk about today, we've got an incredible group of, of speakers who are going to talk about the um, the specific principles, and you can find them in the document, and I think the, the links to it have been have been posted. So I'm not going to go over them here. I think our speakers will, will do that um, in much more powerful and embodied ways. And what I would love to do is uh, just to take some time to step back and look at the big picture. Um, and for me, that big picture is the why. The why. Why? are those of us who are committed to um, really magnifying the leadership of local people and communities in peace. Why are we so committed to that? Um, and I wanna speak to that why through a story. Tell us for peace, we, ha we have been the primary funder and 
a long-term program partner for Fumble Talk in Sierra Leone. And you'll hear from my colleague, John Cocker at the end of this panel today. And our um, main interest was thinking about the system question that Melanie spoke to. How do we not just support local peace building, but create and support a system, the system that supports doing locally led work at a systemic scale. And I just wanna tell a story that to me speaks to at least our why. On my first visit to Sierra Leone, which um, was in 2008, and we had just started uh, Fumble Talk at the end of 2007, and it was, um, and you may, I'm not gonna go into the history of Fumble Talk uh, here, but uh, the main purpose of it was really to draw on the indigenous uh, traditions of Sierra Leone in uh, addressing post-war reconciliation, the tradition and culture of truth-telling and apology and forgiveness as a way to help communities heal from, uh, heal the wounds of war. And I went for the, the it was geared, to the primary sort of um, activity was a bonfire at the community where people would come forward and tell their stories and apologize and forgive each other. And I went over for the first ceremony in March of 2008. And while I was there, I also, uh, it was about a three month process to prepare the communities for those ceremonies. And so prior to the ceremony, I also got to go visit another community, Manoa, um, in the Kailan district in the far Eastern part of, of Sierra Leone that was just at the beginning stages. Um, and, you know, in addition to having to drive 11 hours from Freetown, we had to cross a river that didn't have a bridge and it was a pole ferry where we had to drive the car onto a dock and pole over. I mean, it was a, it was a commitment to get there. Uh, and this was common for the way Fumble Talk worked, but they gathered everybody together in Manoa to ask them first, to explain the Fumble Talk reconciliation process and ask them, do you want to reconcile? And if so, how do you want to do it? And then what resources do you already have? And how can we walk with you in the process? So based on those four questions, that became the first conversation uh, within the community. And it was, those questions activated an incredible, an incredible energy and conversation. And during the course of that, we had all different stakeholders, victims and perpetrators, um, elders, youth, Muslims and Christian, men and women. Um, and near the end of that time together, Libby, I think you, can other people hear Libby? Yeah, we've lost your sound. Libby, we lost your sound just, just now, like two seconds ago. Mm -mm. So Libby, since we weren't hearing you, what I think I recommend is moving on and then circling back so you can finish your thoughts. So ap apologies for that. Um, this is all part of our technological learning experience. But to give you a sense of how we're going to continue the conversation, we've asked um, the donors in the room to be in conversation with their partners, with the idea that what we're really trying to do in this broader system is to shift the power from the power that donors have uh, of giving resources to really be the power of accompaniment. Um, and what does that mean to live that out and to try to decolonize peace building? So we'll have a series of dialogues around the principles. And the first is going to be on engagement principles and strategies with Perry Kamek, who's director of peace building programs at the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, and Yuli Novak, who is the executive director of Here Be Dragons. And uh, Harry, are you going to start? Yeah, I think I'll start. Um, I'm, I'm really the warm up act for Yuli. Uh, so I'm gonna try to keep it uh, uh, very short. So thanks Melanie for this, uh, for the invitation, obviously to Alliance for, for Peace Building and also to the Peace and Security Funders Group for you know really the fantastic 
report on funding locally led peace building, um, I, I had the opportunity to play a very small role in the kind of deliberation of, of, of the project. And so it's really been on my mind quite a bit, uh, you know, during this uh, uh, year of our Lord uh, of the COVID uh, pandemic. And I thought I would highlight uh, kind of two aspects of it, which are kind of challenges for us at RBF and things we're struggling with and trying to work through, but also which I think um, Yuli's work really exemplifies and which she can elaborate on. And those are kind of politics and networks. So the first aspect is the need for donors to just embrace the messy reality of politics. I mean, politics has a bad, bad, bad name, but I think fundamentally conflict is a political activity. It represents the absolute failure of politics. And I like to think of peace building in a sense is the opposite. It's also fundamentally a political activity, but actually represents the pinnacle of political activity. Um, unfortunately, I think there's a tendency for some donors to avoid politics. Um, in other words, to deal with the symptoms and the consequences of conflict rather than kind of seeking to address the root causes. Um, and so I think that funders need to be clear-eyed about what it, especially with themselves, uh, about what it is that they're trying to accomplish. And I certainly don't wanna disparage humanitarian responses or mitigation efforts, which are necessary, incredibly important. They're things that we at the RBF support ourselves. But I think this goes back to, to, to Libby's point, and I'm uh, really anxious to hear the ending of the story uh, with a little bit of a dramatic pause there. But, but I think to her point, if the goal um, is systemic change, then funders themselves have to roll up their sleeves and be part of Hey, I sent you the, I emailed you the link. Political uh, activity. Let me make sure. I think somebody uh, needs to be muted. Thank you. Um, and obviously I'm not talking about elections or political campaigns. The RBF is a 501c3 organization, which the Americans on this call uh, will understand very well. What it means is that we don't engage in political campaigns or lobbying in the United States or internationally. But what I am talking about is movement building aimed at creating a power base for progressive political forces that can confront uh, political pathologies which lead to conflict in the, in the first place. So that's, that's the first point. It's kind of rolling up our sleeves and engaging politically. Um, the second point, and I think it's, if the first point is maybe the more uh, kind of esoteric or abstract one, the second one is more of a methodological one related. Um, and that is the need to support networks and an even entire systems of actors, uh, be they activists, academics, organizations, uh, think tanks or otherwise, peace building is not an island. And to be successful, Peace building ultimately requires the creation of entire communities working to disrupt dominant narratives and to transform and frankly, even dismantle oppressive economic and political systems. Um, it requires investing pro-peace movements with genuine political power. Um, we've started, we're really at the very beginning of our journey at RBF um, in kind of thinking through what this means operationally. But I'm really thrilled that Yuli Novak is here. I think she exemplifies in many ways this evolution of, of the RBF uh, peace building program um, and exemplifies both of these, both the engagement in the kind of political uh, landscape, but also the focus on network building. Um, uh, and I also, if there's time, I hope she will describe the roots of the name uh, There Be Dragons. It's a fantastic name. And there's a, once, you, once you hear the story behind it, I think you'll understand uh, it, it's not an accident. It's very intentional. So maybe with that is kind of an opening, I'll, I'll turn it over to Yuli to kind of shed some life, light on kind of how she's thinking about uh, these challenges of locally led peace building. Thanks, Barry. And Melanie and everyone here who make this thing happen and inviting me. Thanks so much. Um, I thought about how to engage with the topic and I thought maybe the best way will be to uh, ask you to come back with me four years back uh, to 2016. Um, I was then 
at my third year as a director of one of the main and leading human rights organizations in Israel called Breaking the Silence. And a major governmental crackdown on civil society just began targeting Breaking the Silence, my organization, as, as its main target. Um, we went through a period of about two years, and in a way it keeps going, um, of dealing with phenomena that probably all of you know from other places, uh, like ongoing incitement from politics, politicians, from uh, media people, um, endless media items with false accusation about the organization, and what we do and who we are, and some legal procedures that were taken against us. Uh, we were under surveillance for a while. Um, the prime minister himself ordered the secret services of Israel to open an investigation against us, and I can go on. So quite a scary times. Um, during this time, and as reality unfold, we realized that it was getting harder and harder to do what we were meant to be doing, which is to promote human rights, to try and bring upon a political and social change. And we found ourselves more and more focusing on basically surviving, uh, living day to day and, uh, and trying to keep going under with all these attacks around us. Um, after five years as a director of the organization, I was basically completely burned out, physically, emotionally, but also mentally. I couldn't think <laughs> anymore. Um, and in a way, and then, and then I, I, I finished my position. It was in, towards the end of 2017. But what I thought about back then, and I still think that my personal experience in a way is a um, demonstration of something that a symptom for something that happens. It might be an extreme version or might not be an extreme version but something, a crisis that my political camp is facing um, of, that brings us into this surviving mode in which we, we operate, we keep doing our best. Um, okay, so bringing us into this surviving mode in which we're doing our best um, and keep losing again and again. And in a way, it's not even a local phenomena. It is something that I believe um, the progressive camp, left camp, whatever you want to call it, um, all over is facing. And I think it is a symptom for a much deeper problem that we have, uh, that we are a lack of coherent and relevant strategy to work upon. Um, and for me, this is the main and most urgent um, mission that we have today, to figure out what the hell are we doing and how do we fundamentally change the political landscape that we're in and the um, gap or re power relations and the gap between them that is just widening um, um, as we go along. So basically what we're doing, and this is the project that I'm leading with other people here with Dragons, is trying to create a space for activists to work on the ground to be able to um, get out of this vicious cycle and to be able to think in different scales and ultimately, hopefully, to develop a strategy, a current strategy. Now, it's, it's quite challenging because these people that we are working with are waking up every morning with tons of tasks and within this emergency mode and working within this emergency mode. So, and we don't want to stop them from doing that. So what we're, we, we think we have to do is to try to find a way to create spaces for those people who do the job uh, to get out of the paradigm that we're all stuck in that basically are the paradigms of the ones in power, the ones I call the regime, um, but the, uh, our political rivals. And in order to do that, what we're doing basically is gather together uh, leading 
activists from uh, different fields, different struggles, various uh, professional backgrounds, but people who have a very strong position that already walked the walk, that already set themselves, bringing them together in order to try to create a community that will develop new language, new ideas, or to let new ideas to emerge, um, hopefully lead us to a new strategy. Now, I'll just take two things about it. Um, it has a lot to do with identity, but we're struggling very hard not to get stuck into identity politics or into a sort of coexisting uh, um, um, space, nor to create a, a... We're not aiming towards combining or make coordination between different struggles. All these are super important, but in our view, they're still within the paradigm of power that we're in with the divideness that there are in society. What we're trying to do is to take ourselves behind these paradigms and to really create a community based on a new and novel uh, shared language um, and shared ideas, and then to get to a shared strategy, which is very different from a joint struggle or joining different struggles together. Um, I will just say one word of, or a few words on funding in relation to, to that. Uh, in my experience, funding can be a crucial element in keeping us within the vicious circle of, 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 of planning ahead, uh, working on it three, sometimes five years work plans and, and, and strategies and trying very hard to keep in track while reality is completely changing while we're doing that. And having said that, and in my experience with Perry and others who fund us, um, funding mechanism can also be a huge catalyst for creating something completely different. But that has to be built on, first of all, trust and flexibility and a shared deep understanding of the big mission that we have, which is something that we don't, we cannot see right now the, the uh, concrete outcome of it, to let things emerge as we go along. Um, yeah, I think I'll stop now. <laughs> Thank you, Yuli. I wonder if you might want to take Perry's prompt and um, let us know how you named this visionary organization, Here Be Dragons. Yeah, so actually we started with, it's a project that emerged slowly. So for a year and a half, even two years, we work in kind of pilot mode without even knowing we're piloting. Um, and we didn't have a name, so we just called it the dragons, like laughing about it. And after a while, we, we decided, okay, it's a project. We really need a name. Um, and we looked for one until somebody from within the group said, but guys, we already have it. Here be dragons. Said, what the hell? What is here be dragons? And then we found out that um, that was the, written on old maps uh, for uh, marking the areas that haven't been explored yet. And we love that idea of going to the unexplored, but also keeping in mind being a bit self-critical and knowing who drew that maps. And this is the white people who haven't gone to those spaces. So it's about going and exploring together unknown territories, but also always remember that it's not really dragons there. There are probably many things that we just need to um, get to know. Well, thank you both so much. I think you really set the bar for us today in thinking about both the constrictions that funding can put on uh, visionary projects, but also how funding can be a catalyst and how peace building really needs to wrestle with these issues of movements, politics, and narrative, um, moving beyond some of the more um, focused technical spaces into these much broader issues of collective action. So thank you. And I think we should circle back to Libby because I think the story you were telling really speaks both to that long-term support of vision, but also changing the very uh, structure of a movement. So Libby, are you back online with us? I am, can you hear me? I'm hoping you can hear me now. 
Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for your patience with my uh, internet outage there momentarily. Um, yeah, so I was just describing a stakeholder meeting at the beginning of the longer term fumble talk process in one community uh, in the far eastern part of Sierra Leone, um, where after having been sort of uh, asked what they wanted and um, and and also being told that the the culture of the villages themselves was actually really important and valuable and wanted they you know fumble talk really wanted to draw on that culture for this and that one of the elders stood up and i'm just going to read to you what he said he said no one's ever come here like this before this is the first time we've ever been asked what we want and then he sort of gave this historical perspective he said first the christians came and they said your culture is heathen you need christianity and then the Muslims came and they said, no, 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 your culture is bad, Haram, you need Islam. And then the colonizers came and they said, no, no, your culture is backward, you need our civilization. And then the war came and destroyed everything anyway. And he said, you're the first people ever to come here and say, your culture is valuable and to believe that we have resources ourselves to change these, to address these challenges. So I share that because first of all, um, what happened was simply being asked what they want and having the resources that are already there acknowledged and valued, those two things unleashed an incredible energy. And that community began its own three month process to plan its reconciliation bonfire, um, and which was a similar process that was then done in um, over 250 times involving over 4,000 villages and directly reaching over 150,000 people in the coming seven years. Um, and what that shows me is there's a huge untapped power resource in desire. When we take seriously what people want when we take seriously and i would shift that to yearn for and when we make space to uncover to listen for and to uncover um, people's yearnings and communal yearnings collective yearnings um, and make space for that to lead it opens up incredible potential and that's what we saw across um, Sierra Leone and ultimately led to a post Ebola development process that now the government has adopted as a national policy. But I want to just reclaim that language of yearning and the space that it takes. And I, you know, I think, Yuli, about you talked about let new ideas emerge and change the paradigm. And I think the way we do that is we really make time and space for what it is that we're really yearning for. And there's an invitation in that for funders too. Do we really have the space within our organizations and how do we make the space to ask, how do we most want to work in the world? And how do we create our organizations that are really centered in supporting that and moving those ideas forward? We face obstacles internally also. We have to do our own local peace building work, whether it's um, you know, from board decrees or just sort of the way things are always done. Um, and so we have to be on our frontier that way too. Um, and I, I would name actually yearning as probably one of our greatest untapped resources. And that's one of the reasons why we're so committed to, to thinking about um, how do we all do a better job of supporting the capacity of local people and local communities to lead in their, in their own work. And just one um, final idea um, to reinforce that point. You know, I think in the peace building field, in most fields in general, we're so schooled in thinking that we can think our way forward. And it's not that we're not thinking, but I think that can only take us so far. I think we can yearn our way forward into a new system into that new paradigm that you were talking about, Yuli. I think um, there is directionality, there is energy, there is possibility, there is imagination um, in our yearning. And to me, that's one of the greatest fruits um, that I've learned from our um, commitment to working strategically with local, local peace builders. And I think we have a lot more um, to lean into as we do that. So I'm looking forward to hearing the rest of the panel's 
um, and how uh, how you've worked that out in in practice in all the different settings in which you've been working. That was so powerful, Libby. Thank you. An idea of yearning as an untapped resource is just really so beautiful and creative. Thank you. And I encourage all of you, Monica just posted the link to Fumble Talk and John Calker will be speaking, who's the executive director later in our session today. But it's really a remarkable, remarkable example of all that we've been talking about today. So thank you. Um, so we're now moving on to think about um, what and how to fund some of the scope and modalities of funding in order to capture the yearning to, uh, to um, amplify the resources that are so rich in communities around peace building. Um, and we'll have three speakers. Uh, first will be Katrina Fabianson, who's a senior advisor for human security at Swedish CETA. Uh, Dylan Matthews, who's the CEO of Peace Direct and Stella Vuta, who is the Program Director for International Understanding at the Robert Bosch Foundation based in Berlin. And uh, Katrina will be starting us off. Katrina. Thank you very much. And, and again, thank you, Melanie and the organizers and for inviting me to this. Uh, started off so interesting that I feel like I'm totally off track with what I'm expected to be talking about. Um, based mainly on the, my job before CEDA, Swedish CEDA, uh, where I work with the UN uh, missions and, and really truly saw the importance of locally led peace building in contexts such as East Timor, Liberia and Burundi and local ownership, not only of externally imposed programs, but, but uh, programs that really original, originate from the stakeholders in, in each specific context. So very, very uh, interesting start of this, this uh, session. Uh, for Sweden, for CEDA, we, we truly welcome the guiding principles uh, for funding locally led uh, peace building since it brings many relevant messages uh, for the donor community by emphasizing, as you've mentioned, the need for local peace building leadership, building strong partnerships, promoting flexibility and enabling long term core support. Uh, through our work at CEDA, we embrace many of these recommendations already. Uh, this includes, for instance, providing that, this flexible support that allows for changes in programming based on each specific context and enables direct access to funds by local peace builders. This also means lowering expectations on reporting of results, a little bit what Yuli was into, uh, where, where CEDA, for instance, is moving more away from right, rigid results-based matrices and instead valuing outcome harvesting, dialogue with partners, narratives from the field, and, and looking at that as results instead of, of uh, locking our partners into systems where they have to, to follow up. So, so it provides for more flexible uh, and, and qualitative monitoring and evaluation. Um, we also believe that it is important to, to support local civil society organizations. There's a tendency to channel funds more through UN, through governments and international NGOs, but we're looking more and more into, you know, who are the actual local actors? Um, and with this, again, comes the need to avoid imposing agendas, but instead finding ways to support locally driven programs based on their needs and the challenges in each, each specific context. Uh, one area that we find particularly important is to assist to society organizations through multi-year core support that helps them strengthen themselves as organizations. More donors are sadly moving away from this and instead focusing on funding shorter term projects, but without the core support, the organizations will not be able to implement the project and sustain themselves. And as the note says, long term uh, support to organizations through core funding also strengthen, strengthens the local ownership, internal capacity, and allows for flexibility and contextually based priorities. Uh, however, what we've obviously understood too, being a donor agency that's also accountable to our taxpayers who provide the money. <laughs> Such core support also demands that our partners have robust systems for internal control. 
so to overcome that, CEDA therefore allocates specific funding to support the review and strengthening of these systems as parts of its collaboration. And in many cases, this has also provided a basis for sourcing funding from new donors. Um, examples from CEDA support includes our work on gender equality, for instance, where direct support to women's rights organizations in conflict and post-conflict countries has increased tremendously over the past 15 years from very low levels to almost 32 million US dollars last year. And we also support, uh, which was mentioned earlier, networks of uh, locally led organizations, such as the United Network of Young Peace Builders under our programming for youth peace and security. And through core support here, we aim to strengthen the network as well as building the organizational capacities of their 110 members across the entire world. Uh, to allow uh, more direct support to youth-led peace building initiatives. We also support small grants windows through our partner organizations, which Dylan will uh, give examples from uh, Peace Direct and he, uh, to elaborate further. Um, and uh, with this is, is uh, understanding that many times there's a lot of initiatives out there that are very good and, and create great impact uh, towards uh, building peace, but they require small funds. And as a, as a larger donor, it's very often difficult to, to identify these. And in those cases, it's, it's good to have organizations that actually have this as their core mandate to, to work that way. Uh, one of the recommendations in the note is that also to follow, to allow funding for mapping of existing initiatives and actors and which is uh, what we did for instance in, in the case uh, with the uh, peace direct that, that dylan can tell more about so to sum up looking at my notes we therefore agree that we need to combine long-term support with flexibility and be brave and innovative as donors we need to engage with a variety of actors and build trustful partnerships and be context specific one of our requirements when building partnerships is that programs are implemented through a conflict sensitive approach that acknowledges context specific challenges and opportunities. And in the field of peace building, this is of course more important to allow partners flexibility and ability to adapt to changing conflict dynamics. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katrina. And I know that that message is those messages are music to the ears of everyone on this call today. Thank you. Dylan. Thanks, Melanie. Um, and thank you, Katrina. So uh, good to see you all. Great to be part of this conversation. So Peace Direct is a uh, international uh, NGO based in uh, the UK and the US. We are not a traditional funder. We would call ourselves more of a regranter. So we don't have our own funds. We have to work with uh, donors to persuade them to uh, fund flexibly and, and to support us to find and support local peace building organizations around the world. And uh, Libby mentioned about this, this, this peace building potential that sits in, in communities. And, and as Peace Direct, we talk about this a lot. We talk about civil society being the, representing the largest untapped source of peace building potentially globally. And, and, and we really do believe that, you know, this, this huge untapped peace building potential that sits in each country that is not being utilized and and sort of liberated because the funding just doesn't get to local organizations. So in the last 15 years, we've been supporting uh, local groups, uh, trying to strengthen the ecosystem of local actors and really strengthen that 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 base of, of local organizations that connect uh, to each other and start to build sustainable peace uh, from the community upwards. And over the last 15 years, I think we've seen at least seven, you know, there's seven areas that we that seem, seem to come up time and time again, requests, seven requests, and none of these are new. None of this is rocket science. Um, I would say this year we've consulted with almost 2000 local peace builders and the same requests keep coming up. So I'm just going to share those with you. The first is provide flexible funding not tied to donor log frames. Please, no more log frames, they ask. You know, why do we need to complete these things? We know what we want to do. Why can't you just trust us is, is the question they ask. The second is please remove the hoops that we need to jump through in order to access funding. 
Why are there so many bureaucratic hurdles, which are which which have built up over time? In the time that I've been in the sector, I've seen layers upon layers being built up of uh, they, it's whether it's fiduciary risk, it's risk of terrorism, it's it's um, fraud. I mean, any number of excuses are given, and the 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 those compliance issues become more and more onerous for local organisations to the point where they can't apply for funding. So please remove those, those hoops that we need to jump through. The third is please provide unrestricted funding. Now, unrestricted funding is a sort of holy grail of in the funding world. A lot of organisations, a lot of donors just don't provide it. We're still stuck in this, I think, this, this mentality, which I call the tyranny of M&E, which I'm sure my monitoring and evaluation friends won't like uh, me to say, but we're, we're sort of stuck in this tyrannical regime where everything has to be me measured. Everything has to be output focused or very clearly measurable. And actually, we know that peace building is a long process. We know it's messy. We know it's intangible. We know that it's connected to multiple other uh, variables. So, you know, it doesn't really fit into that uh, clear out output um, sort of mentality. Um, fund over the long term because we know that peace is a process. So why is it that donors st still stick to this sort of projectized way of funding? They also ask us time and time again, fund quick and small and not just big and slow. And I think this, this, this real problem that we have right now is that donors, particularly institutional donors, that their funding is becoming bigger and bigger and they're giving actually larger grants to smaller numbers of organizations. So even with uh, the UK government, they might give tens of millions or possibly even hundreds of millions of pounds, but aren't able to give a thousand dollars. Now we understand why, but actually local organizations don't often need lots of money. What they need is small amounts of money very quickly. The sixth request is fund opportunities to strategize together. So this is about building the ecosystem. Most, we are still tempted, I think, within the donor community to think about these, you know, uh, easily measurable outputs. You know, how can we demonstrate that our funding has led to something? And I think that's a real problem when we're talking about peace and the messy process of building peace. So how can we support organizations to strategize together? We have found in our own work, when you just provide space, and time for organizations to meet together without an agenda, magic happens. It, 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 incredible things happen. And they can, you know, you start to see collective impact work, you start to see collaboration across communities and across different sectors. And they find it um, liberating because they, they often say to us, we haven't ever had that opportunity to just to talk and strategize together. And the last one is fund us directly and not through the usual suspects. Please don't keep funding the usual suspects. So when we talk about funding local, a lot of donors will talk about funding a national organization who may replicate some of the worst practices anyway in terms of um, empowering uh, local communities and involving including local communities. So don't fund the usual suspects, fund directly. Now we know of those seven that it is very, very difficult to fund, uh, for, for institutional donors, particularly institutional donors, to, to, to meet all of those seven requests. So what can we do? Well, at Peace Direct, we're trying to figure out how we can address all, all those seven. And, and it's going to take time. We know that for some donors, particularly the institutional donors, asking them to fund quick and small, asking them to fund unrestricted, asking them to be more flexible when they have their due diligence requirements. As, as um, Katerina says, they have, there are very high standards that some governments will expect, which are very, very difficult for local organisations to comply with. So that's where the role of intermediaries can come in. And, but I think with the role of the intermediary, like Peace Direct, we also have to recognise that we have to remove our own ego from this. Because I think that there are lots of organisations that have their own idea of what they want to do. When I say organisations, I mean INGOs. They have their own idea of what they want to do. And actually, we have to remove our ego from that process and start trusting local organizations. So we're, we're heavily emphasizing trust-based philanthropy, trust-based giving, which means that we don't then layer upon layer of um, uh, bureaucracy. So I'll give you a couple of quick examples and then, and then we'll wrap up. The first is we've launched something that we call the Local Action Fund. The Local Action Fund is simply a regranting mechanism. It doesn't say what the local groups should fund. The idea is that we are supporting organizations in country to act as regranters on our behalf. So 
those lo local organizations might be networks, might be slightly more well established. They might have the the backbone, the sort of a due diligence and compliance backbone to be able to manage some of the the big donor requirements. And what we do is we provide them with funding th from an institutional donor, just like CEDA, to be able to provide small grants. And in doing so, we are able to support tens or hundreds of small um, civil society organizations that wouldn't have the opportunity of accessing funding directly. And in do uh, and I think, you know, having a regranting mechanism which doesn't have those specific set um, agendas around what type of work to fund is extremely important for local groups. This year we launched the Digital Inclusion Fund in response to COVID and we said peace builders anywhere can apply um, and you can apply for as little as $50 and we had over 2,000 uh, people applied. We were delighted that we could give a grant of just $80 to one group in Bangladesh who wanted support. Now most donors cannot even contemplate of giving small aid, small grants like that, but if you can, if you remove your ego from it as much as possible and you trust that local organizations know what they want to do, we hope that we can see some transformation in, in civil society peace building activities. The second thing that we're doing is that we are now um, focusing on the financial sustainability of local organizations. They say to us, we want uh, to stand on our own two feet. We don't want to just be going out with a begging bowl constantly. Now we understand, we can't always access unrestricted funding. So we've established a financial sustainability fund to actually help local organizations generate their own income by setting up small businesses. We've supported already a taxi business in Eastern Congo run by our local peace building partner, and they are now earning enough money to cover the costs of some of their staffing, which means that they're not stuck in a projectized cycle where they have to go to donors to ask for funding just to keep their core staff going. So for, for us, this is a really exciting area and we would absolutely uh, encourage others to do the same. Think about how you can actually provide funding to help local organizations generate their own sources of funding and the last thing is just to is is um to invest more in what we call peace exchanges these these opportunities to strategize together we don't you don't have to try hard to support network building and and strengthen the ecosystem it happens almost organically as long as you provide space and time uh, for that, for those opportunities to take place. And we've don't been doing this now for 10 years, and we're really excited to see how um, civil society starts to connect with other civil society actors. And um, being here, being supported by um, the Robert Bosch Stifting and also CEDA, I can say that both organizations have taken a really flexible approach to supporting Peace Direct. When we said to them, we need as much flexibility as possible to support local organizations. And both of them have recognized the limitations that they have with their own organizations and their own bureaucracies and have still found creative ways around that. So this gives me a lot of hope that there is the tide is turning and donor, um, the sort of donor emphasis on supporting local peace building will lead to much more progressive, much more creative um, grant making in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dylan. And I found myself thinking about how your seven principles would map onto what Yuli was talking about of the space that dreamers and yearners and peace builders and activists really need for allowing those to come to fruition. So thank you. Next, Stella. So thank you. Thank you, Melanie, and also Catriona for organizing this fantastic panel and also for, for having me. I feel really honored also listening right now to, to the speakers before me to be part of this group. So um, Dylan and Katerina um, and also Libby in the beginning um, and, and uh, the other speakers, they gave us some wonderful insights into the rich experience um, of their organizations. And I'm here today to share with you the experience of the Royal Bosch Stiftung, an organization which in contrast has only very recently decided to focus on locally led peace building. And my key message for you today is supporting locally led peace building as a grant maker feels truly groundbreaking in both a positive as well as in a very challenging way. So for those of you who don't know us yet, the Robert Bosch Stiftung is one of Europe's largest foundations associated with a private company. It is based in Germany and it's active in the areas of health, science, education, active citizenship and international understanding cooperation. And me, Stella, I'm the program director for the topic of peace. 
So the foundation has a very long history of working uh, on international relations and also working on peace building for almost 30 years. And uh, we have supported in all this time a lot of fantastic projects and organizations, and we are um, today very, very proud of our work. But nevertheless, this summer, we took the decision to put the support of locally led peace building front and center of our entire peace portfolio. This happened in um, a strategic review process that we started in 2018, um, which um, focused on all of our international work. And for the topic peace, our departure point was the question, what makes peace last? In this process, we talked to more than 100 different people from all over the world. And as you can imagine, if you talk to so many people, you get a lot of different opinions. But one thing that almost everyone agreed on instantly was that the best solutions for supporting sustainable peace are indeed found by those impacted by conflict themselves. And that therefore, indeed, for us as a foundation, supporting local leadership is critical. So in my experience, deciding on locally led peace building as the core of our strategy, and this of course is thanks to my trailblazing colleagues here on this panel, and also of course in, in the audience, um, this was really the easy part. The challenge started when it came to putting the principles into action. And uh, Libby mentioned this, this challenge before. And um, why is that? So man, in my experience, um, just, just imagine you're in a car and you have this new destination. And you start driving and you drive and then you realize you cannot find the space you want to go on the map that you usually use. So you have to find a new navigation system. You somehow you figure it out, you start driving again, you keep going, but then suddenly you arrive at the end of the road. And that is when you realize that the car will not be able to take you to this place, but that you need a new means of transport. And then at this point of time, you also begin to wonder, and maybe it shouldn't even be me in the driver's seat. So what does this mean? So for us, it means that if we intend to support locally led peace building, we won't get there by applying the same mechanisms that we've been using for years for a new group of partners. And it's not enough to just listen to voices from the field. And instead, you have to be willing to critically look at everything that you are accustomed to and to ask questions that are important but also uncomfortable because they concern the way you define yourself as an organization and especially as a donor and including the question of how decisions are taken and by whom. So in short, supporting locally led peace building requires a truly systemic approach. We at the Bosch uh, Stiftung, even though it is challenging, we realize that it's important and we are absolutely committed to do this and to ensure true co-creation and co-decision making, as well as mutual accountability and learning. Our locally led peace initiatives, they will take up their work next year in the Western Balkans and the Sahel. They contain the principles mentioned in the fantastic report uh, by PSFG and um, stand for some fundamental changes in our funding. So amongst others, they are not limited to the classic two or three years of a project, but they cover a time span of up to 10 years. Instead of predefined milestones and outputs and goals, the focus lies on establishing trust and collaboration with and among our stakeholders in our selected regions. And we will also continue to work with our esteemed partners, uh, such as Peace Direct, and uh, support their innovative mechanisms to support local peace builders. And uh, I'm sure you can see that I'm very excited about this, but we also really don't fool ourselves in thinking that we have found all the answers yet. Um, we are really still very much at the beginning of our learning journey. And I would also like to take uh, this opportunity to thank all of you, uh, a lot of those who are on this panel and also in the audience who have accompanied us so far, uh, who were always ready to hand us uh, a new map or point us in a new direction. And uh, I also really look forward to continuing uh, this journey of ours uh, in the future and then also sharing our learnings with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stella. And it's, it's been really inspiring to follow the progress that you've made as a foundation in this pivot to uh, the, the new car and driver, but also acknowledging the roots of the, the founding of the Robert Bosch Stiftung and how influential you were in the peace in Europe and now kind of thinking about what this looks like for the next century. So really welcome to this local peace building movement. 
Uh, so uh, just looking at our time, we have about half an hour and I wanna make sure we honor all of our speakers. So I'll be a little bit regimented and suggest that each of our next speakers probably takes about six minutes each, which will give us a time um, for a full wrap up and hopefully a few questions. Um, and I know we could probably have spoken all day and probably all three days on this subject without exhausting it. Uh, so thank you all so far. Um, and now we're moving on to the role that other roles that funding funders can play around organizational development and adaptation. I think there's actually been a theme that's, that's run through of how do we marry our aspirations towards movements and um, a larger collective action with actual organizational imperatives. So Katriona uh, from Peace Nexus, you're up next. Great, I hope you can hear me without too much interference. Um, thank you very much, Melanie, for convening this whole panel. I, I'm also inspired um, by hearing that all the, the funders, certainly on this panel, are in, totally in line with this report. Not, not all of them were involved in developing the report, including us, but um, that it, is, it is very gratifying to, to see that there is a group, um, both of bilateral and also foundation funders, that are already bought into this and already doing it. I mean, or, or it, you know, it's one thing to say national ownership or locally led, but doing it is, a, is a, as, as a, has been mentioned, requires quite some courage and trust and, and thinking differently. So um, Peace Nexus is a foundation. We've been around for about um, 10 years or so, and we are not a, a funder in terms of project funding. And right from its inception, Peace Nexus has tried to focus on the accompaniment role. So what, so other roles that uh, funders can play. And one of the reasons it was created was to, to support the investment in peace building organizations, in local champions. But in how can um, a third party outsiders support their development? And the reason why I think it's so pertinent when I was listening to Yuli is that many of the organizations um, that we work with are in survival mode or you know in emergency mode and even if they have the knowledge and have the vision their organizations often lack the space to have that reflection to do to do strategy properly to invest in the systems that that also relieve the tension um, sometimes within the organization so one of the, the main things we do in four areas is provide um, organizational development support um, to uh, organizations that have great leadership potential in their, in their context. And um, that can take different forms. And I see some of those forms were mentioned in the paper. So one of the things we do is a company strategy processes. And when I say that, it's we really seek to find local um, uh, facilitators who are who know about the context know about peace building but can really hold the space for a very participatory process um, and give it enough time and we support with funding that process but not necessarily the projects uh, or, or the that, that comes out of it um, but having said that we found that when organizations have the time to really reflect on where they want to go and how and what the new strategy will be funding often follows. Um, so for example, we worked with UNOY who, who is now funded by CEDAR. And I think you know, that process of reflecting on their niche and their role helped in, in some way. Um, so, uh, so, so, one of the, so as I say, most of the time we do that, we also recognize that the leadership of many organizations is, is stressed and also could do with accompaniment. So we support leadership development, but not in a way of, you know, of trainings, but opportunities for peer coaching and mentoring between leaders. And that's one of the things we do in a collaborative way too, is to bring um, what could be competitors, so peace builders in the same context, to provide each other with peer coaching support. So that's another form of accompaniment that, uh, that we support. And, um, and then there is also a, a, num a range of less sexy um, kind of nuts and bolts supports that organizations need. Often it's restructuring, it's, um, it could be how to make a, an m and &E system manageable. Again, things that project funding does not allow an organization to necessarily invest in, but nevertheless really 
help the organization run. So what we tend to do is we develop a roadmap with our partner about urgent things and necessary things and, and take and, and recognize that an organization can't do lots of things at once. So sequence what are priorities and over some time seek, seek to build a, a rounded capacity. Um, and, and finally, just to say something about what that involves. So I am very gratified to hear that a number of funders are combining program or project funding with sort of what is called capacity development. Or, but often that is, for example, in order to be able to receive the money. So it focuses on for, you know, fiduciary due diligence or, or control systems. Um, and it's rare to find also in, in local context, um, you know, consultants or, or, or support it, um, well, people that can act as a consultants that really can nurture um, uh, other elements of the of organizational development. So the, the, the longer term vision, the strategy. And, and I think that there's another need there in terms of ecosystem building to develop that kind of network of, of professional facilitators that really are, are very good at, at, at accompanying a whole organization rather than a project. Um, so finally, I'd, I'd like to say that, so, so I do think that the, um, there are many roles that funders can play. And while we've specialized in that kind of that role and don't provide the project funding, I think it is possible to combine both. And I know a number of foundations do try and combine both, but that requires also an investment in what is the right kind of coaching accompaniment, not, a, not an approach which is, you know, we will do it for you, um, but we will support you in doing it um, and relieve you of some of the, the burden and the cost. That's it from me. Thank you so much, Katrina, and just for the role that Peace Nexus has played in supporting so many of the organizations and networks in our field in, in such a unique way. Thank you. Um, and now I'm delighted to have Marana Starcevic, who is joining us from the Youth Initiative for Human Rights in Croatia. Um, hi, everybody. Hi, Melanie. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for hosting this. Uh, thank you to Katriona uh, from Peace Nexus, uh, which uh, we are proud, proud to be working with in the last few months. And we are very uh, anxious and happy for our, the continuation of our work. Um, so um, I'll tell you a bit about us and how we got started. So Youth Initiative for Human Rights uh, was founded almost 12 years ago in Croatia by some crazy young people who decided to go against the grain and who fought the, like, the dom dominant political discourse about uh, the homeland war being all innocent and righteous. Um, and they cooperated with youth initiatives for human rights in the region, so the Western Bar Balkans region, the former Yugoslavia. And the motto of those young people was kind of, uh, we should first clean up in our own yard. So we are advocating for the minorities in our country, for the victims um, of the national armies and such. So the topics that we were dealing with were, you know, dealing with the past, conditional justice, uh, reconciliation, and recently we started a program on social innovation and development as well. Um, but this, is more, this was more out of necessity uh, because the funding for the core of our program for you know, the tough subjects was lacking. Um, and um, I, I would maybe like to stress the, the positives role that funders can play, not, not to just dwell on the negatives. Um, but for instance, what Peace Nexus does with us and what was really like kind of new and eye-opening was this luxury of time uh, like an organization is saying you have to stop now you know like what what yuli was saying about burnout about like feeling uh, like on the fence all the time like now you have to stop you have to take this time for yourself you're worth it we're gonna you know like lead you through, through it and um you get this luxury of time really i keep calling it a luxury because there's no other word to express, uh, to explain it. You get to sit with your team uh, to reevaluate, to reflect, to ask the difficult questions that were like lingering in the air that nobody dared to ask. Um, and this is really like funding the process. You know, it's hard, it's exhausting. It, it can be equally hard as uh, burnout, but it's a process um, that helps heal and grow, which is totally amazing. And I would only, 
wish that more donors have this, uh, you know, understanding of um, things that come up. Okay, COVID has come up all over the world. So this is so unique that everybody's in the same boat right now. Um, and instead of this being like a wake up call for us, okay, guys, let's work together. It's not happening. So this was a running joke in the office that, you know, oh, we will never have world peace. Uh, this is so hard. Maybe the only solution is to have like aliens attack us or have some external enemy that will, you know, attack the whole humanity and something will happen. And now we have COVID and it's not working. So we are kind of running out of ideas here. Um, but I digress. Um, so um, just just to come back to the session, I was listening on the PeaceCon yesterday, uh, um, a person from UN Foundation was speaking about crisis scenarios for the COVID crisis. And um, is something that, again, many of us don't have the luxury of time to stop and think, wait, what will happen in the next six months? What will happen in the next year? How will all the structures that were like uh, going around uh, in our daily work change um, are we talking to the right people? Are we finding the right people to fight our cause? Um, so our objective has always been to find more new crazy young people who are willing to go against the grain, who are somewhere out there, maybe in some rural area, who don't have the lingo, who don't know the project, you know, talk, but whom we are willing to invest in, maybe to this thing that we started calling guerrilla budgeting. Maybe I shouldn't tell it to the donors, but yeah, we're kind of doing it by uh, putting a little bits of the budget for like fees for young people, for instance, to like make an art installation to commemorate victims or, I don't know, to write an article about war crimes. Little, you know, because there's many people who have never been invested in, who have never been told you're worth it. Like, so we are trying to do this on a mini, mini level and I think COVID now with the, you know, uh, restructuring of budgets and no more overheads, no more fancy dinners and caterings is allowing us to come to the donors and say, hey, please, can we move this unnecessary um, funds to actually fund some young people who want to try something new? Um, but I digress. Um, uh, uh, what else? I mean, I was so inspired by all the talks before me that I really don't, uh, I had many uh, points to touch upon, but maybe um, what Dylan was saying about the removing the ego, I would also stress this as a way of that NGOs, that the NGO um, ecosystem can help the funders by collaborating, by finding common ground and you know, working together and not being competition to each other when they're applying to you, but like making new partnerships, um, not going with the usual suspects all the time. Like for us, the last year was a real revelation when we opened our office for anybody who wanted to use it, basically just, you know, like to socialize, do a ad hoc initiative. And we had over a thousand people come and go. And some of them would never approach us because they, thought we had a stigma of being, you know, like hardcore and things. But when they got to know us, they realized, okay, we can work together on, on building new things. Um, so yeah, providing space and time is very crucial. And I I can't wait uh, for next year and hopefully some, I don't know, vaccines to work so we can finally uh, be in the same space again. Um, but yeah, I think I will stop now. Rana, thank you so much. I'm just that phrase of asking the questions lingering in the air that no one dared to ask. I think that's so beautiful and that every funder should have the experience of working in or um, leading an organization that has to raise funds and just to know how precious that mental space is. It's not just time, but it's just that room to breathe. And I'd also say that the um, imperative to collaborate is not only for NGOs, but for donors that if we could come together collectively and try to leave some of our silos, what kind of efficiencies and space would that give to the field? So maybe it's something to think about. Um, so I'm delighted to turn the floor now to John Calker, who's the Executive Director of Fumble Talk, joining us from Sierra Leone. John, the floor is yours.
Thank you very much, Melanie, and good day to everyone. Um, I'm so inspired with all what I've had so far in a way that I don't even know what to say. However, I'll attempt to just share my little experience working with Catalyst for Peace over the last um, 13 years, thereabout. Um, building mutual accountability and learning into partnership is very crucial uh, for us as local peace builders. Um, the report talks about partnership built on strong relationships are foundational. That is correct. Because in the event of a lack of trust, it makes it hard for local partners, I mean the local peace builders, to forge ahead. Now, um, how, do we do, how did we go about this, you know, in our 12 to 13 years experience with CFP? Point number one, donors should encourage local peace builders to have the courage to go through the hard and difficult conversation. Funders should also try to open a direct communication channel because for most local peace builders, it's an emergent design, more so in post-conflict or post-crisis situation. We go to communities knowing that the answers are there. We don't go to communities with a preconceived notion to tell them what to do. We go there to facilitate the conversation. And sometimes there are unexpected hurdles that we have to address. And if the donors have set stringent um, outcomes, it makes it difficult for us to even continue. So there comes the need for a mutual trust an open communication channel. Because at some point, you need to call the donor to say, hey, um, we agree to have um, meetings at chiefdom level. I'll give you this, this example. When CFP and FAMBO Talk entered into partnership, the initial design was for us to organize the um, peace process, the bonfire at the chiefdom level. We thought it's easy. We're talking about 160 something bonfires across the country. When we went to the consult with the people, the people said, no, we want our conversation to happen at the village level. So they're talking about thousands of villages. So I had to pick up the phone and call Libby. How do we address this? I said, okay, let's negotiate. And we agreed to work at a sectional level, which is um, a cluster of 10 to 15 villages. That is just very important because had we stick to the chiefdom level, we will not get the type of... Um, <coughs> outcome we are enjoying now. So that is lesson number one, to have that open channel of communication. Also, local peace builders, the leadership, we carry um, a moral responsibility to be with the people. And the foundations or the funders, they have a fiducial responsibility. So it's important to find that balance. The internal controls should be really robust. But however, how do you ensure that local peace builders who work in a remote village, who don't have a gas station, I mean, an official gas receipt, how do they proceed? How do you have that conversation? How do you talk about, okay, for us as local peace builders, sometimes we struggle, but just having that opportunity to call your funder, for them to listen to you, it's really important. To me, that is part of building the mutual accountability. It's important for local builders to adhere to um, the financial and other um, responsibilities. However, it's also important for the donors to respect the moral um, credibility that these local leaders have in communities because at the end of the project or program, when the funders leave, the local peace builder stays in that community. And you want to stay there and remain, you know, and maintain your face. So it, this is very important because we are in this together, the funder and the peace builder. The funder has the, um, you know, they want to support local peace building. The local peace builders, they are standing in between the funders and the communities. So 
it's also important to acknowledge their role. You know, just a little tap on their back. Oh, you're doing great. Keep going. It goes a long way. That mirroring, you know, sometimes we make mistakes, not intentionally, but how do we sit together and correct that mistake? Knowing very well, we have, both of us have stakes in it. It's important to talk about trust, both for the funder and the um, local peace builder. It's important to talk about, um, you know, being sensitive to the community needs. Don't tell them what to do. It's easy for local, for funders to say, look, go organize five or 10 conferences or go, or go, go facilitate meetings. Maybe that's not what the people want. And maybe it's the timing. When you want this thing to happen, the people know they want to address the root causes first before they talk about moving forward. So, I, I mean, we, we don't have much time, but I just want to say I'm open to further conversation along the line, but building mutual accountability, you know, and learning from each other is key to success for local peace building. Without that cooperation with the um, funder and the peace builder, it makes it hard, almost impossible to sustain the engagement. And I, I believe we all have something to learn from each other. That is why the mirroring back both to the funder and to the peace builder is key because we learn along the way. And as I said, I'm open to further conversation down the road. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much, John. Just so much appreciate uh, your reflections. I wonder if just in a minute, you could talk about a situation where maybe there was a disagreement uh, between you and the funder. Um, and you, you have such a positive relationship overall. How did you, how did you come to terms? Um, you, you see, we design a process whereby we meet frequently. You know, we have in-person meetings, like Libby have been to Sierra Leone, I think over 30 or more times now. You know, when the founder is involved in the program, they see the challenges. You are able to address them, you know, and sometimes, you know, because we are local peace builders, we shy away from the reality. We don't want to lose the funding. So it's important for the funder to proactively reach out to you. Look, the internal controls, more so like the internal controls, you know, to have robust internal controls. Most funders are working with local peace builders, not just to do work, but to make sure they sustain beyond their funding cycle. And how do you do that? Someone talked about the importance of, uh, you know, developing robust internal controls. So they are able, we are able to access funding from other sources. Because of our cooperation with CFP, we are now accessing funding from different donors. You know, we are now in discussion with the government to scale the program nationwide at regional level. So I think, you know, it's just the courage to sit and talk. And sometimes it's really hard. It's really hard. And of course, we all recognize the irony there that as peace builders, it should be what we are most able to do and how difficult it is in these circumstances. Thank, thank you for your transparency and candor there. And now it's, it's a pleasure to turn the floor to Alex Toma, the executive director of the Peace and Security Funders Group, who's done so much to bring these locally led peace building uh, principles uh, to fruition for, for her very vibrant community. Hi, yes, um, thank you. So I, I really appreciate this conversation and um, certainly I feel more like an observer than an expert um, right now. And I know we're also super short on time. So what well, the task I've been given, <laughs> the hardest task um, is to sort of sum up what I heard and what are some of the principles that you all know and have embodied so well in your work, um, both as funders and as um, grantee partners. So I'm just really appreciative of this incredible community um, and I'll, I'll do my best to sort of pull out what I heard across all the themes that I heard across all, all of what you said. So um, the first thing that I, that I heard were, was that um, funders need to be more clear-eyed with themselves, rolling up their sleeves um, and really engaging in a, a political landscape and in terms of building power with their grantees hand in hand. 
Um, and I heard, I love Libby, I love your term of yearning along with thinking. And so kind of marrying the, the two sets of, of ways of being as a, as a human being, really. That's the sort of like big uh, initial bucket of things we've heard. The second, um, therefore, the second uh, I heard is to support networks. Um, that uh, Perry, you said this, peace building is not an island. Um, I love that as well. And working really to disrupt dominant narratives and a dominant ecosystem. And I'm so proud that all of the members here that spoke with you, the PSFG members that pulled together that report, I shared it on the chat, um, are really leading these efforts of um, questioning, asking themselves uncomfortable questions, as Estella, I think you said, uh, of you know, why are things the way they are? Um, who's getting the funding? Why are we funding the same people over and over again? As we've heard from the grantees, we can't keep funding the usual suspects and expect to get different results. Um, so that's the sort of big thing is supporting networks, not funding the same usual folks, um, but an ecosystem of new and innovative creative uh, folks on the ground who actually know what, what needs to be done. The third is um, funders using their power to make the space, um, create space for the grant for their grantees to, to do their work. I mean, it seems pretty obvious. We talked a lot about general operating support, multi-year long-term funding. Um, I love how, um, I think Dylan, you were the one who, who pulled up the, the examples about um, the bureaucratic hurdles that you encountered when you came into this field and kind of saying like, why are these all here? So, um, I, and I think it was um, Katrina who was talking about, you know, qualitative and flexible monitoring and evaluation. And let's do more of that, um, especially in this field of peace building, which is long term. It's messy. It's not a sort of this goes to this and then this, you know, this thing I created. Um, um, we, we talked a lot about, and John, you mentioned this again, sort of mutual accountability. So working together in partnership to allow for mutual accountability of results and of success. Um, we talked about building trust and collaborate, like true collaboration um, and having a shared deep understanding of a long-term mission and a long-term vision of what we're, we're working towards, even if it may not be in our lifetimes. Um, and then finally, the sort of um, fourth uh, thing that I, that I heard across all of what you were saying is letting your ego go and just getting creative, um, as I mentioned, sort of asking uncomfortable questions about who has the power in the decision-making and trying to challenge that um, and challenging your own assumptions and your own thinking of what you think is right. And Stella offered the beautiful example of um, different modes of transportation, let's say. So it's a car and then what is it? We don't know. Um, and so as we go towards the, you know, there be dragons world of Yuli and colleagues and others, I think it's, all of these principles are really, really important. And frankly, um, I've been in the in the field for 15 years at this point. Even though change seems like it should have happened, you know, 500 years ago, it is happening. And even in the short 15 years that I've been working in the peace and security philanthropic field, I have seen shifts in funders thinking um, and in the ways in which they are letting go of some of these um, untested assumptions about what works and um, who gets funded and why they get funded. Um, so I'm, I'm really proud to be at the helm of the Peace and Security Funders work, but really working hand in glove with all of you doing the actual work and supporting you and, and continuing to push you to, to push yourselves to um, shake things loose and really try and get to the, the goal that we're all working together as a community of a more peaceful world for everybody. So I'll stop there, Melanie, um, and happy to have you close. Well, thank you, Alex. I think you are a, a genius in every setting that I've seen of being able to sum up complex conversations that were just beautiful, thank you. And I'm just thinking, maybe as a creative exercise, we only have five more minutes, and I think we do, can't go back to our panelists to have, to have questions, but we have this beautiful drawing um, that Mona has made for us. What if we hit, pin that as so we can really see it big, and everyone write in the chat two words that you take away from the drawing, um, about how you're feeling today, what you're seeing, and then we can keep a record in the chat. And maybe we'll, if we could do that for a few minutes um, and then give ourselves a collective round of applause. So Xander, is there a way that we can make this bigger? Say that again, apologies. Is there a way we can, oh, there we go. So as we, as we see this beautiful representation put in the chat, what comes to mind a few words or maybe what do you feel is missing?
you make it a uh, full screen, you might be able to see it better. Um, ah, okay. Yeah. The yellow on the gray is a little bit hard to see. Do you want me to read some of them? Sure, that'd be great. So, collaboration and trust, community empowerment and accompaniment, respect, networks, sustaining change, missing, centering women and brown, black folks in the work. Uh, trust, respect, empathy, uh, beautiful, uh, where are the dragons, right? Okay, um, <laughs> I think she's gonna work on that. Uh, trust, communication, communication. I'm assuming, and uh, community resilience. Um, let magic happen. Mutual accountability. Uh, M and E for who? Emergence. <clears throat> Keep the faith with what you're doing. I guess don't give up. I just love love to reflect that I don't think I've ever been on a panel about funding and I've been on a lot where the words such as yearning, magic, space um, have come out so powerfully. And I think this is really, this is at the heart of peace building. And sometimes it gets filtered out as we get into more of the technical funding conversations. So I really want to thank all of you for engaging at this level. And I hope that that really is the level that we will be speaking about in the future. And it's wonderful seeing all of the people what you're saying in the chat. The translation of the voices from communities into seats of global power, holding space. Mona, can we add uh, dragons? <laughs> yes, I will do that afterwards because it's a little bit hard to just do that on the go because I don't know how to draw it. Sorry, <laughs> but it will come for the final version, I promise. <laughs> Thank you. everyone, we're just about at time, but I wanna thank all of our panelists today for being so uh, candid and inspiring. Um, again, to thank Peace and Security Funders Group for this report that was such a wonderful jumping off point. Uh, and just to thank all of you for the work you're doing in building peace during this time of really seismic transition in the world. Thank you, everyone.